Hello and welcome to video lecture number 100. Uh, today we are covering the rise of the new right. Our subsections are Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan, champions of the right, free market economics and religious conservatism, and finally the Carter presidential interregnum. So Lyndon Johnson's Great Society represented the high point of American liberalism and the idea of an activist government. The Great Depression had given birth to a very successful political movement that spanned three decades and, in the process, transformed the U.S. government and America's position in the world. The strength of liberalism was its emphasis on programs that shored up the middle class, such as Social Security and Medicare. But what began in the 1930s as a widely supported effort to regulate capitalism and moderate its excesses had, by the 1960s, evolved into a government commitment to abolish poverty and achieve nothing less than racial and social justice. The crisis managers of the New Deal had long since given way to the uh, technocrats of Johnson's Great Society. Growing concerns uh, that the federal government was getting too big and too powerful and had strayed too far from its traditionally defined constitutional duties and responsibilities led Republicans to nominate in 1964 a genuine conservative for the presidency, Arizona's popular senator Barry Goldwater. Goldwater's uncompromising vision of the United States as freedom's model uh, in a searching world stirred a new generation of Americans and helped set the stage for a powerful conservative reaction that began in 1972 when Richard Nixon won the White House in a huge landslide election. So let's go ahead and have a closer look at the rise of the new right with our first subsection, Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan, champions of the right. Ronald Reagan came to national prominence in 1964. Speaking to the Republican Convention on national television, he delivered a powerful speech supporting the presidential nomination of arch-conservative Barry Goldwater. His impassioned rhetoric supporting limited government, low taxation, and law and order won broad support among citizens of the most populous state and made him a force in national politics. Narrowly defeated in his bid for the Repu Republican presidential nomination in 1976, Reagan counted on his growing popularity to make him the party's candidate in 1980. Now, in 1964, the conservative message preached by Ronald Reagan and Barry Goldwater appealed to few American voters. Uh, then came the series of events that mobilized opposition to the Democratic Party and its liberal agenda, uh, such as a stagnating economy, the failed war in Vietnam, African-American riots, a, a judiciary that legalized abortion and enforced school busing, uh, and an expanded federal regulatory state. By the mid-1970s, conservatism commanded greater popular support. Let's go to our next section then, free market economics and religious conservatism. The conservative movement resembled a three-legged stool consisting of anti-communism, free market economics, and religious moralism. Uniting all three in a political coalition was no easy feat. Religious moralists demanded strong government action to implement their faith-based agenda, uh, while economic conservatives favored limited government and free markets. Both groups, however, were ardent anti-communists. In the end, the success of the new right would come to depend on balancing the interests of economic and moral conservatives. Now, since the 1950s, William F. Buckley, the founder and editor of the National Review, and Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize-winning economist at the University of Chicago, had been the most prominent conservative intellectuals. Friedman uh, became a national conservative icon with the publication of Capitalism and Freedom in 1962. The Heritage Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute, and the Cato Institute issued policy proposals and attacked liberal legislation and the permissive culture they claimed it had spawned. 
Now, the most striking addition to the conservative coalition was the religious right. The perception that American society had become immoral, combined with the influence of a new generation of popular ministers, made politics relevant. Conservative Protestants and Catholics joined together in a tentative alliance as the religious right condemned divorce, abortion, premarital sex, and feminism. Charismatic television evangelists such as Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell emerged as the champions of a morality-based political agenda during the late 1970s. Falwell established the moral majority in 1979. Backed by behind-the-scenes conservative strategists such as Paul Weyrich, the moral majority boasted 400,000 members and 1.5 million in contributions in its first year alone. It would be the organizational vehicle for transforming the Fourth Great Awakening into a religious political movement. There were others. Uh, Phyllis, Phyllis Schlafly's Stop ERA, which became Eagle Forum in 1975, continued to advocate for conservative public policy. Uh, Focus on the Family was founded in 1977, and a succession of conservative organizations would emerge in the 1980s, including the Family Research Council. Now, by the late 1970s, the New Right had developed a conservative message that commanded much greater popular support than Goldwater's program had. Religious and free market conservatives joined with traditional anti-communist hardliners in a broad coalition that attacked welfare state liberalism, social permissiveness, and an allegedly weak and defensive foreign policy. Ronald Reagan expertly appealed to all of these conservative constituencies and captured the Republican presidential nomination in 1980. So let's talk about the president then, Jimmy Carter with the Carter Presidential Interregnum. Carter had an idealistic ver vision of American leadership in world affairs. He presented himself as the anti-Nixon, a world leader who rejected Henry Kissinger's realism in favor of human rights and peacemaking. He withdrew economic and military aid from some repressive regimes. Uh, he signed a treaty turning control of the Panama Canal back to uh, Panama uh, and crafted a framework for peace between Egypt and Israel. While Carter deplored what he called the inordinate fear of communism, his efforts at improving relations with the Soviet Union founded. Uh, after ordering an embargo on wheat shipments to the Soviet Union and withdrawing uh, the SALT II treaty from Senate consideration, uh, Carter called for increased defense spending and declared an American boycott of the 1980 Summer Olympic Games in Moscow. He and Congress also began providing covert assistance to anti-Soviet fighters in Afghanistan some of whom, including Osama bin Laden, uh, would, uh, would, would change uh, into anti-American Islamic radicals uh, several decades later. Carter's ultimate undoing uh, came in Iran, however. Uh, since the 40s, Iran had been ruled by the Shah, or the King, uh, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. Uh, ousted by a democratically elected parliament in the early 50s, Pahlavi sought and received the assistance of the CIA, which helped him reclaim power in 1953. Early in 1979, the Shah was driven into exile by a revolution that brought the fundamentalist Shiite cleric Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini to power. When the United States admitted the deposed Shah into the country for cancer treatment, Iranian students seized the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, taking 66 Americans hostage. The captors demanded that the Shah be returned to Iran for trial. Carter refused and instead suspended arms sales to Iran, to Iran and froze Iranian assets. For the next 14 months, the hostage crisis paralyzed Carter's presidency. Several months later, however, a stunning development changed the calculus on both sides. Iraq, led by Saddam Hussein, invaded Iran. Desperate to focus his nation's attention on Iraq's invasion, Khomeini began to talk with the United States about releasing the hostages. The hostages were finally, re finally released 
the day after Carter left office, a final indignity endured by a well-intentioned but ineffectual president. President Carter's sinking popularity uh, hurt his bid for re-election when he was barely renominated for the presidency, um, which is unheard of for an incumbent. Carter's approval rating was historically low. A mere 21 percent of Americans believed that he was an effective president. Economically, millions of citizens were suffering from stagnant wages, high inflation, crippling mortgage rates, and an unemployment rate of nearly 8 percent. With Carter on the defensive, Reagan remained upbeat and decisive. To emphasize his intention to be a formidable international leader, Reagan hinted that he would take strong action to win the hostages return. To signal his rejection of liberal policies, he declared his opposition to affirmative action and forced busing and promised to get the government off our backs. Uh, Reagan effectively appealed to the many Americans who felt financially insecure. He emphasized the hardships facing working class and middle class Americans in an era of stagflation and he asked them, are you better off today than you were four years ago? Carter received only 41% of the vote. Uh, independent candidate John Anderson garnered 8% and Reagan won with 51% of the popular vote. The Republicans elected 33 new members of the House of Representatives and 12 new senators, which gave them control of the U.S. Senate for the first time since 1954. Okay, so that's it for video lecture number 100. Today we talked about the rise of the new right. So at this time, go ahead and answer your review questions and continue on with your notes.